there's a slide that says webcast has ended, but actually it hasn't started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Nicolas Veron uh, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. It's my pleasure to introduce this last session of the year for our financial statement series at the Peterson Institute. And I um, don't do it on every session, but since we're re reaching the holiday season, I want to warmly thank all the team at Peterson who makes this series uh, possible, particularly Sarah Chu and Jessica Parada, who are here with us in the background and make this uh, session possible, as they do in every session. And the whole meetings, uh, communications, IT support teams at the Institute, which really do a fantastic job. And uh, uh, again, this series couldn't exist without them. Now, um, maybe moving away from the warm feelings of the holiday season, we'll discuss the Basel III endgame, the so-called endgame of the Basel III Accord uh, today, and particularly the U.S. debate. Uh, Stephen Cecchetti um, is a... Uh, uh, a regular in this series now. You already spoke in February 2021, Steve, um, and have participated in many sessions. Um, Steve studied at MIT and at the University of California at Berkeley. He got his PhD in economics in 1982. He then was a faculty at New York University in 1987. He joined Ohio State University. He was director of research for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the late 90s, 97 to 99. In 2003, he joined Brandeis University Business School, um, and he's also held visiting uh, positions in numerous places, including Oxford, Melbourne University, Boston College, Princeton University, and I'm probably forgetting some. From 2008 to 2013, for five years, uh, Steve was a chief economist, economic advisor, and head of the monetary and uh, economics department at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, a major policy position in the world of banking regulation and capital requirements. And then he went back to uh, Brandeis. He's the author of uh, the textbook Money, Banking, and Financial Markets, the title says it all, which was first published in 2006. And among his numerous uh, advisory and uh, leadership positions, uh, I should mention that uh, since the spring of this year, he's become the chairman of the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. So he has a, a, a foot on, in, in the debate we're going to discuss today also um, from a European, uh, on a European geography, if I can put it this way. Uh, Yao Zeng studied at uh, Beijing Institute of Technologies and at Peking University, where he got his master's in economics in 2010. He then uh, moved to the U.S., got his Ph.D. Uh, at Harvard in 2016. He's been an assistant professor of finance at the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and then uh, since 2020, has been a faculty at Wharton, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, where he became the Gulub uh, faculty scholar uh, this year in 2023. And uh, Yao's research is uh, largely on the interplay between banks and non-banks, um, which is also a major dimension of the discussion we'll have today. So with that, Steve, over to you. Thanks very much. And let me... Uh... Let me share my screen and uh, and let me start by thanking uh, thanking Nicholas not only for that very kind introduction but also for the hard work that you do running this series from which uh, which we all benefit. I know that I whenever I can I I join uh, I, I try and and join the the discussion. Um, let me um, let me start with what I think is uh, a rather amazing statement by Senator Tim Scott, the ranking Republican member of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. Um, this was a statement that he made as an introductory statement uh, with a last week uh, as a part of a hearing that included the bank CEOs. And I'll just read it. It says the Basel endgame is simply requiring more capital on the sidelines which then means fewer dollars to lend to small businesses, first-time home buyers, car loans. So the actual impact of higher regulatory standard is fewer dollars to lend to Americans. 
Now, somehow bankers have been able to convince the politicians of this. It's clearly wrong. It confuses sources and uses of funds and confuses liabilities and assets. Requiring banks to have more capital funding makes the system safer and more stable. Well-capitalized banks have more skin in the game, so they lend to healthier borrowers. They can also lend even in bad times, so credit is less pro-cyclical. The remainder of my comments, um, I'm going to uh, talk about the role of capital funding in making banking safe, um, the banking system both safer uh, and more effective in allocating resources. And just to emphasize it, um, I think that we should move away from the term hold capital because that suggests it's an asset. Uh, and we should say some, I should, I use the term have capital. So to make sure that we're all on the same page and to understand what capital is and what it is not, um, I want to start with this um, this very simple balance sheet on the right-hand side of this slide. Capital is a source of funds, and it's always employed. It's never idle. It's on the liability side of the balance sheet. It's important because uh, of the impact that it has on incentives. Uh, first of all, it's the bank owner, the bank's owner's skin in the game. It's important because it's a buffer uh, to absorb losses. Uh, since this is the bank's equity, it functions like equity in uh, in any other firm, which is that it's the residual claimant receiving what's left over from revenue after the payment of all other expenses. Um, but it's also uh, it's important to keep in mind as we think about this uh, and what to do what to do here that it's difficult to measure, especially during times of turmoil when assets can be illiquid. It's also, of course, important to measure difficult to measure because of issues associated with goodwill, deferred tax assets, and other intangibles. Now, um, what about the claim that higher capital funding reduces lending? I've always found this odd to see why consider the following thought experiment. Let's say that a bank increases capital funding by retaining earnings. That is, it has more capital because it retains some of the earnings one year. That is, it has more funding. Is it going to reduce lending because it now has more funding from uh, from uh, uh, equity sources, it seems rather odd. Now, to see what's happened in recent history, I plot this very simple picture. This is not, I'm not, I make no claims about causation, just correlation. Um, on the horizontal axis, I have the net worth of, as a fraction of total assets for the entire U.S. banking system, and on the vertical axis, I have the fraction uh, of lending. As a, as a fraction of total assets. And these are monthly data from the uh, Federal Reserve's uh, banking, monthly banking release um, uh, from 2010 to 2023. Uh, going before 2020 has problems with definitions and coverage and the like. Um, now, it sure doesn't look to me like higher capital is associated uh, with lower lower lending. In fact, the coefficient on the line that I fitted through these points is, is about two. Um, so for each percentage point increase in capital funding, lending seems to go up by two percentage points. Now, um, the, there, there are surely a, a few reasons for this, but one of them is related to my thought experiment, which is that higher capital funding increases a bank's capacity to lend. And it does that especially, of course, in bad times, as I emphasized at the beginning. Second, when bankers have more lending capacity, it turns out that they're going to be more willing to lend to healthy borrowers. If they have more skin in the game, uh, they're going to be more careful about the risks uh, that they take. Now, um, so authorities are suggesting increases in the level of capital funding that banks would be required to have, and bankers are complaining. Um, they say that capital funding is expensive, and to be clear, I actually think they're telling the truth. From their perspective, it is expensive. Capital funding has private costs for a number of reasons. The biggest arise from distortions uh, in the tax law and the bankruptcy code and the presence of the safety net. All of these favor debt finance and favor increases in leverage uh, and, the inc and increases in risk taking by banks. But none of these, I would assert, are, no, are, not, are social costs. In, in the case of the safety net, since they are designed to address negative externalities, things like banking system panics, fire sales, and credit crunches, and in the case of liability to facilitate broad ownership of 
private assets. These cannot be social costs. I should say the tax code distortion is something that doesn't exist in all jurisdictions. So it clearly can't be a social cost either. So this argues, I think, quite compelling. It allows us to argue compellingly that social costs of capital are, are far lower than private costs. And, uh, and they have benefits in the form of a more resilient sh system. I'm quite sure that current capital levels and even those performed, proposed, I'm sorry, in the Basel III endgame uh, proposal are far lower than what it, those that would equate social costs and benefits. Now, I think it's important to note that the current level of capital in the system, as measured by the leverage ratio, which is really the number that we can get on a comparable basis over several decades, is back to the pre-2010 level uh, for globally systemically important banks in the U.S. These numbers come from the uh, Federal Reserve Can Bank of Kansas City's bank capital analysis. They're generated out of quarterly reporting by the banks, so they're only available quarterly, but you can go back fairly far. Um, and what you can see, I've drawn this little arrow there, uh, what you can see from the solid, that's a solid dark line. I think it might be black. I'm not sure what the color is. But that solid line, you can see that the levels now are nowhere near where they were um, so where, where they were even over the, the last uh, over the last decade. Um, so those numbers are quite a bit are quite a bit lower than they were. Uh, the dashed line, by the way, is what conforms to the uh, the, the supplementary leverage ratio um, for the GSIBs, which is what's in my table. Now it's also the case that small banks have uh, much higher capital levels than the large banks. Um, and that distorts, I think, the, the data if you just look at averages. Um, now, uh, the current proposal uh, in the is the final US implementation of Basel III. That alone makes it essential because the US is a key participant in the Basel Committee and was a key participant in the negotiations that led to the international standards uh, which this represents the implementation. For the U.S. not to fully implement Basel III, I think at this point, would actually be a disaster and could spell the end uh, the end of, uh, of the international standard setting that I think we all benefit from. Now, that said, the proposed rule also addresses some of the failings revealed by the March 2023 turmoil. This is the failure of SVB signature in First Republic um, and the... Uh, and the, the systemic risk exception that was placed on uninsured deposits um, by the uh, U.S. authorities um, to, to ensure un all uninsured deposits uh, following the weekend uh, in mid-March. Um, now, um, just the three main lessons that I want to highlight here are, first, that you're always going to bail them out, even mid-sized banks. Second, supervision is essential, but it's never sufficient. And third, uh, we need to move to some form of, uh, of mark-to-market accounting. Now, let me go through each of these very, very quickly, because I know I'm short on time. Now, starting with the fact that you will always bail them out, authorities face an insurmountable time consistency problem. It's impossible to make a credible commitment to not bail out banks banks that might, and I emphasize might, be systemically important. No one wants to be the parent of the next, uh, the next financial crisis, the next Lehman event. It's essential that we accept this and formulate the rules accordingly. The obvious solution is to reduce the likelihood of the need for a bailout by having higher capital. Let me emphasize that I was pressed on this by European authorities and there are no bailout rule. And I basically said that I don't believe that they'll implement it except in the case of the smallest, in the, of the smallest banks, uh, which I think for which I think there is quite a, a lot of evidence. Anytime the bank gets to even medium size in Europe, they bail it out. Um, now, um, turning to supervision, detecting risky behavior is always gonna be difficult. Uh, one way to think about this is that authorities are in an arms race with the private sector. The private sector is trying to take and hide risk. Uh, authorities are trying to detect it and the authorities are gonna always lose. But even if they do find the risky behavior, they face a very high bar for imposing remedies. This is one of the main lessons of the bar report, I think, on the SBB failure that was published last spring, which was the difficulty, even when supervisors found uh, problems in imposing remedies. 
Finally, I think it's not unrelated to the SVB issue, changing official attitudes, or more accurately, I think the knowledge by the industry that official attitudes may change with a change in the people who are making decisions weakens the credibility to sustain a rigorous system. And again, the solution to this is to improve incentives of the bankers by forcing them to have more skin in the game and game and to have higher capital requirements. Finally, uh, there's mark to market accounting. We need to revisit accounting rules. Moving to mark to market accounting, moving away from book value accounting is gonna have a number of very large benefits. First and foremost, I think it improves transparency. Um, granted, we can all read the footnotes in banks quarterly reports and we can all download supervisory reports, uh, but we need to have a much more accurate and timelier picture of banks net worth than those, those are offering us now. Um, this is going to have a number of benefits. Um, first, it's going to focus supervisors' attention on the uh, on the frailest institutions, um, the and, and they're going to know which ones they are. Second, it's going to encourage better, better risk management by the banks. And finally, I think, and this is very important, it's going to allow resolution authorities to uh, to act in a timely manner because they are forced to act based on reg on uh, on regulatory capital which uses uh, the capital rules um, that we have um, in play the accounting rules that we have in place. So finally, just to conclude this very brief presentation, capital funding in the largest banks is now back to pre-2010 levels. Uh, capital funding in mid-sized banks clearly, clearly proved inadequate in 2023. And most importantly, the social benefits of higher capital requirements um, clearly outweigh social costs at current levels. There's no evidence that increased capital funding reduces levy, lending at the current levels. Um, and cap, higher capital uh, funding is going to guard against a combination of poor private sector risk management incentives, ineffective supervision, inaccurate accounting, poor resolution um, practices, and changing policymaker preferences. So with that, I'll stop and thank you very much uh, for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Very rich uh, scene setter. I have tons of questions, but first, uh, Yao. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for the uh, very nice platform. And thank you, Steve, for the super interesting discussion about the idea and uh, all the um, effects, especially the positive effects of capital regulation, and which is super helpful for us to understand the next steps as we potentially implement the Battle of Three Endgame in the US. So I want to first echo Steve uh, exactly. I mean, when we think about all the bright effects, I do think large banks, they are more capitalized compared to pre uh, global financial crisis. They're more relate and resilient, especially in crisis times in terms of provide long-term lending uh, to the real side of the economy. And uh, if you look at what happened earlier this year, in the middle of the regional banking crisis and uh, centered at Silicon Valley Bank, we actually had inflows, but not outflows to the largest banks. So it's basically not a banking crisis for the whole banking sector, but, um, but um, better capitalized large banks, they, they, they do provide a resilient role in that regional banking crisis. So um, I think uh, the most interesting thing is the kind of unevening the playing field idea of implementing higher capital requirements for mid-sized banks, which I do think is quite important because those banks, even if they are not systematically important, systemically important, but we understand it better now those banks, I mean, they may, uh, the failure of them may still generate speed over to the payment market, to labor market, and to uh, potentially uh, the innovative side of the economic sector. So uh, we need to better incorporate those things into the ecosystem. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to also say a little bit of things in the spirit of debate, because um, and I think another important role for those large banks, especially the very largest banks, is beyond the role of then extending long-term capital or long-term funding to finance the economy. They also act as market makers or arbitrages to provide short-term liquidity 
to graze the economy. What do I mean here? What I mean here is banks, I mean, they also act as, for example, primary dealers in government bond market. They are particularly important in US treasury market, both the primary market to directly participate in treasury auctions, and also they are important dealers in uh, secondary market to provide liquidity. They are broker dealers in corporate bond market, that's still a traditionally voice market. If you want to trade corporate bonds, you still have to call those largest banks and you talk to those dealers and you get a quote and uh, they're gonna handle those trades for you. Banks are market makers in foreign exchange market. That's uh, arguably the very largest financial markets. And uh, given the increasing role of US dollars as a dominant currency, um, we may have to pay more attention to the role of big banks in that market. And also they provide short-term liquidity in repo market. That's another important short-term funding market to um, finance a lot of important roles in the economy. And what happened in the last decade was um, banks basically retreated from providing short-term liquidity in those important short-term funding market partially due to increasing capital requirements and fragmented roles. And uh, we did observe a couple of things. For example, the um, increasingly hiccups in important short-term funding market, like a treasury market during March 2020. And at the beginning of the COVID crisis, we had the so-called treasury market inconvenience. A lot of, um, like, especially long-term treasury bonds, actually, they became quite illiquid during that time. And we observe a lot of so-called quarter and hiccups in financial markets, like CIP deviation or the arbitrage spread between IOER and EFFR, a lot of different things like that. Windows banks, I mean, sometimes we argue that they are pretty much like window dressing. Windows banks are subject to higher scrutiny during quarter end about their capital requirements. They tend to retreat from financial markets, but the effect could be even more general. And also we had the repo market uh, crisis in September 2019, uh, during which the, if you look at the tri-party treasury market, the intraday repo um, rate spiked for almost a thousand basis points. There was and quite unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, in history. And even Jay Powell himself admitted that uh, the repo crisis was something that kept him awake at night. So those things, I mean, again, so those are not exactly about lending to real business, but they're about providing short-term liquidity to grace different sides of the economy. And those costs are perhaps hard to be assessed. But I do think one important thing for us to and uh, to, to keep in mind is to potentially incorporate the roles of banks as short-term liquidity providers or market makers into the whole picture. And uh, it might be important to acknowledge the roles of banks in those aspects in the future consideration, to think about how we can potentially streamline different types of regulatory rules. For example, how can we think about the complementarity or maybe conflict between risk-based capital requirements and supplementary leverage ratio, which uh, can uh, and, uh, can play some important role in determining banks' willingness in providing liquidity in short-term funding market. And also we may potentially watch the potential of risk migration to non-banks because again, when banks are subject to higher capital requirements, uh, non-banks, they kicked in like hedge funds, particularly again, during March 2020, we saw that hedge funds played some uh, importantly disrupting uh, rule in and treasury market. So those are things that I would love to add to the picture. Thank you. I think you're, you're uh, Nicholas, you're still mute. Oh, sorry. Um, after, after three and a half years of this, I still haven't learned. Um, Steve, um, this argument about market making first, uh, I mean, is that, that's been, um, a discussion for a long time, including when you were at the BIS. Uh, so how do you see the argument generally about the role of um, of banks in providing uh, market liquidity? Uh, and second, specifically in this current phase of Basel III endgame in the US, what exactly are the proposals about and uh, do we find them well calibrated? So, well, the calibration I think is hard to tell, and it's in, it's it's in, it's a it's a sort of a moving target at this point. So, um, obviously, the banks are trying to weaken the the calibration, um, uh, but I think that it's important to keep in mind the 
that most of what uh, Yao has described are what I would describe, what I would call intended consequences of the changes. That is, the idea here is that you should insist that banks that are engaged in trading operations, whether they be market making per se or uh, or for their own uh, for their uh, for their own account, uh, that the, that they have. Uh, that they have capital buffers associated with those. Um, it's also the case that what one of the big lessons that we learned um, now 15 years ago is that it's gross exposures that matter, not net. And, uh, and that's why we set up the system intentionally again to make it less likely that repo would be done by banks per se. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind that there are certain things that we want to drive out of banks. Uh, we, we want the requirements to, in fact, push things into other parts of the, uh, of the financial system. Now, coming to the market making activity, I think that there are a lot of issues associated with markets uh, and, in fact, with systemically important markets. Yeah, I mentioned corporate bonds. I don't care about corporate bonds. Corporate bonds never trade um, anyway, so it's really not a big deal um, that, there, that there, there's never been any liquidity in corporate bond markets. Um, they trade very, very rarely. If I want to buy a corporate or a municipal bond in the United States I some, or sell one, I sometimes have to wait a day or two, even in the current system. Um, but the issue with uh, with U.S. Treasuries, I think, is, is an important one. And there are a number of people that have made a lot of uh, suggestions on things to do about that. Uh, things like central clearing, all-to-all -all trading and the like, I think, would be important. It, it, it's clear already that most of this stuff, including the repo and the, and the U.S. Treasury trading, has been driven largely out of the banks per se and i'm in favor of that i don't want it on the banks uh on the bank's balance sheets it's been very highly it's been penalized even before this end game uh by the uh by the by the capital requirements and the and by importantly by the liquidity requirements so um so i'm not troubled by this and uh and i think just, to, need just to, to push you on this um if we look at the uh liquidity stress episodes that Yao mentioned um and is it the case that these episodes have become more frequent, that uh, central banks have to intervene more than, uh, you know, would be ideal? Or do you think this is a well, feature? Well, I, I mean, I, so you've, so you've asked, or you've asked sort of three questions. The first, a factual one about whether they've become more frequent. Um, it's possible that they've become more frequent. Um, it's possible that they've become more frequent because of the knowledge that central banks will intervene. Um, and uh, but I'm not a, I'm not actually sure about whether they've become whether they've become more frequent. Uh, it's certainly the case that central banks are much more likely to intervene because they're much more gun shy about what might happen if they didn't intervene. The last intervention in March of 2020, I think we should put to one side. It was a very strange. It was a very strange episode, you'll remember. And my guess is that some of the illiquidity in markets occurred because a lot of the trading operations had to be moved into people's basements. Most people that were engaged in those trading operations were not allowed to trade from home for compliance and cybersecurity reasons prior to the pandemic. All of a sudden, you had to set up compliant, secure systems in people's homes. This took time. So the fact that the markets were dysfunctional for a week or maybe even less, it seems to me is unsurprising under those circumstances. Now, should we have um, should we have central banks that are ready to intervene? I think in some cases, the answer to that is surely yes. Should we have banks that are unsafe because we want them to be able to provide markets? Absolutely not. Yeah, could I add? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I want to add a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I do think, I mean, it's an important thing to consider, um, which is the interaction between central bank intervention and uh, um, banks' role of providing liquidity in the short-term funding market. Because as Steve mentioned, I mean, we did have um, more and more large-scale asset purchases directly operated by the Fed or uh, other central bankers. And there has been some debate about whether we should going forward rely more on those 
I mean, even anticipated large-scale asset purchase programs versus maybe we can better streamline the capital requirements for banks and to potentially let bank back into the ecosystem. And I understand, I mean, there are a lot of different calibrations in that um, aspect, but uh, I'd want to highlight that this is not a very obvious um, debate. So another thing I want to, I want to highlight is um, there's another interaction between central bank's effort in terms of reducing the total size of the balance sheet, because when generally with banks, they have um, higher um, capital requirements. Obviously, it's also a time in which they tend to and hold more central bank reserves and to better facilitate their trading, to facilitate their lending. But right now there has been some conflict going on, which is the Fed, and, I mean, is trying to decrease the aggregate supply of central bank reserves. And that was potentially the one of the driving forces underlying the 2019 repo market crisis because it's like, I mean, there are two forces when the Fed tries to um, shrink its total balance sheet, banks become a little bit worried about the liquidity in the intraday payment market and intraday interbank lending market. And uh, given the tightening uh, capital requirements and that potentially lead to, um, I guess, lead to some hard time for those banks. So I, I think that's another important dimension for us to keep in mind. Can, can I just respond to one thing very, very quickly? And that is that I think it's a misinterpretation of September 2019, um, that this had to do almost surely with one large actor that found themselves short at the end of the day. And that was a miscalculation by somebody who probably deserved what happened to them. Um, for the, for us to change the system because of that, I think is is not is not really appropriate. The other thing is that that the Fed, I think, is at this point is reducing uh, is is in fact not reducing reserve levels. What they're doing is shrinking their balance sheet to reserve to reduce the overnight reverse repurchase facility, and um, and and that will get down to some level which could be very very low. But I don't think they're going to go to the point where they actually start reducing reserves. What we're seeing right now is reserve levels that banks actually want to hold. Um, and those numbers are in the sort of three to three and a half trillion dollar range. And they're doing that partially for uh, for liquidity risk management uh, of their on their own balance sheets. Yeah, I do agree with that. Yeah, I don't think that's an important lesson okay. we learned from the yeah, so United States. Let's move on. Uh, sorry. Um... Let's move on uh, to the the proposal itself, so, so, the Basel III and Game proposal um, in the US. Uh, a lot of the lobbying against this proposal is uh, premised on the idea that it goes beyond the global accords, that uh, the US authorities have engaged in what uh, lobbyists uh, typically call the gold plating. And therefore, it's not just, as you mentioned, Steve, a question of complying with the global uh, agreement, but also a question of, you know, the U.S. authorities adding stuff of their own on top of what was agreed in Basel, including uh, with uh, Randy Quarles uh, at the Fed uh, back in 2017. Uh, what's your view on that? Is, uh, are the U.S. authorities gold plating too much? Is it a good idea? Are they not gold plating at all? Uh, they probably are in increasing requirements above what it, remember the Basel three requirements are a minimum. And so they're a sort of lowest common denominator. Um, they're an international agreement. So in some sense, uh, they, they were an agreement, by the way, that a number of people were unhappy with at the time because they were so that they, they, they were not sufficiently rigorous. They're not high enough. Um, as I suggested in my comments, I think that social costs uh, of higher requirements are are far, far lower than social benefits. They may even be zero at the current level. And so I find it hard to believe that what's being recommended is uh, is somehow excess resilience. Uh, what's being recommended is that is that banks actually have enough skin in the game that they're that they're forced to to accept losses and that they can't uh, can't rely on the safety net as much in order to increase their uh, increase their return on equity. Um, I, I guess I don't I don't shed any tears over that. Yeah. No? Agree with Steve. Yes, on his assessment. Um, okay, so let's move to maybe um, mark-to-market -market accounting. Um, Steve, you mentioned we need more of it. Uh, there are a number of uh, points and questions in the Q&A. Uh, Bokrun Chang uh, is um, 
noticing that the number of assets and liabilities are hard to mark to market and that there's a lot of volatility in the race environment. So, um, uh, and, and conversely, Martin Helwig is reminded, uh, reminding us of mark-to-market losses of U.S. banks uh, amounting to some $2 trillion uh, in discussions around um, the March 2023 crisis. So how exactly is it, Steve, that you would change that? Um, are you suggesting that capital requirements should be fully marked to market or would that be too volatile and too pro-cyclical? I mean, can you give us a bit more detail? So I guess I'm not arguing for marking to market and I'm not arguing for market to market on a minute by minute or even day by day basis, but some sort of, I think that there does need to be some smoothing. I think you should, mark, the, the statement that, that marking to market creates volatility it's in capital measures, I think, is not a reason to have even more inaccurate capital measures. So if you measure net worth poorly, very poorly right now, I think you need to improve it. And the improvement, it's true, will have noise, but it will be better. Um, Mark, so on that basis, there were several comment questions in there, I think, on this. I think that, that, the, uh, that, that we do need to move to market-to-market -market accounting as best we can and some smoothness. Martin's point about, uh, about March 2023, I don't know if the number was $2 trillion, if it was $1.5 trillion, uh, but it was certainly a significant fraction of the capital in the U.S. banking system. Um, the unrealized losses that the FDIC uh, actually computed that were on marketable Asset uh, securities portfolios were about seven hundred and fifty billion dollars. My question, my point there is that if you were to do that, banks would have to hold higher capital to begin with, and so yes, those numbers could be quite big. Uh, but as interest rates were rising um, during twenty twenty two, especially, uh, it was eating into the valuations of all of the bank's assets, and they should have been ready for that, and they should have had buffers that were that were appropriate, and then we wouldn't find ourselves to where we are now. So the discussion is, uh, revolves around uh, interest rate uh, risk in the banking book and the ways this can be uh, uh, addressed partly with uh, supervisory intervention, what the Basel jargon calls Pillar 2. Uh, decisions, uh, which has been the case in Europe more than in the US so far. So can you get us a bit more into this debate and whether the US maybe should just align with European practice on interest rate risk in the banking book or is not is that so, more complicated? Yeah, so f first of all, let me just let, let me just say that that um, all of the information that I have seen from people like the sing like the single uh, the single supervisory mechanism as it's called, which is the supervisor for the largest one hundred roughly one hundred and twenty largest uh, European banks, uh, suggests that the uh, unrealized losses on their balance sheets are actually quite low because interest rate risk is included in their capital uh, in their capital calculation. Um, so we could, it, it would certainly so, be- Sorry, improved. just for clarification, is it that their unrealized losses are low or is it that they have- Their unrealized losses are low. Their unrealized losses are low. And okay. uh, their unrealized losses are low. And the reason is that they've actually implemented interest rate risk calculations already. So there's okay. nothing sitting out there that would, so there's nothing sitting on their balance sheets that if you were to market to market, or I should say very small numbers, uh, you know, numbers in the in the, in the the low hundred, uh, several hundred billion euros. Those are not big numbers. I realize if it was my wealth, it would be a lot, but that's not what we're talking about here. So, um, so, um, they they have implemented supervisory practices, as you point out, which have have, have largely solved um, or at least not led to this particular problem. The other thing is that their in, their stress tests uh, include interest rate uh, changes in them, which the U, interest rate increases in the last European Banking Authority stress test that was done last. Uh, last winter and re reduced, re released in the spring, um, they included interest rate increases, which we did not do in the United States. Um, so I think they've handled interest rate risk uh, 
much, much better than we have on a lot of different, in a lot of different cases. Do I, I would, I always prefer what's called pillar one, which is something that's hard coded rather than pillar two, which is supervisory discretion. And I prefer that always because it is less likely to be gamed and it's less likely to um, to rely on the judgment not just of the supervisors but of the of, of the decision makers and um, and so I think that it's easier to weaken pillar two guidance and pillar two requirements than pillar one requirements no. Yeah, I agree with what Steve just said, especially in terms of pillar one versus pillar two. I mean, I'll do, I don't want to echo Steve's point that in terms of market to market, and I do think, I mean, some kind of smoothing is probably necessary, but I also, I'm not sure if like day to day or minute to minute market to market is something we actually need because there is idea of banks being sacred keepers in the sense that we do need some sense of information protection from and the general public from the depositors uh, knowing everything on the asset side, because that's essentially, I mean, a kind of trust we have to build into the ban and the banking system. And also, I mean, in terms of like bank balance sheet, we do have to keep this kind of information um, barrier between the balance and uh, between the two sides of balance sheet, so that depositors they can jointly act as a pool of um, liquidity insurance across each other. So, especially given the increasing um, amount of uninsured deposits. Because at the end of the day, I mean, some people need liquidity today, but other people don't need that. So that's exactly the idea of banking, which can provide this insurance to people without actually asking too much, too many questions about the um, asset side. Let me let me just make one more very quick point before you ask. I know there are a number of questions, but if the if the resolution authority had been acting based on something closer to market prices, SVB would have been shut down in the middle of 2022 based on, on the, the prompt corrective action rules in the US, which is for a 2% leverage ratio. Their leverage ratio was clearly below 2% by the middle of 2022 if you even read their quarterly report. <laughs> but the authorities couldn't do that because uh, they were required to use different accounting practices for their uh, for their resolution decisions. So um, let me see. We have a question about Julia Kirali, which I think is about the same uh, field. So um, it's again about liquidity versus uh, solvency, right? Um, well, I, I would take issue with the statement that SVB was a liquidity problem. SVB was a solvency right. problem, for sure. SVB, as I say, SVB, by if you read the footnotes, which even I could read, okay, and I'm not an expert on this by any stretch of the imagination, in their quarterly Come report, you, if you read the footnotes um, in their quarterly report, you will, you will be able to do a very quick calculation that they were insolvent or close to insolvent in June of 2022. Explains the failure of market discipline, right? I mean, from what you say, SVB's share price should have collapsed uh, through the year 22. This didn't really happen. Why? That's a great question. I have no answer. I'm shocked by the fact that that didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there is some interesting observations about how sleepy depositors are in terms of like being attentive to interest risks. Oh, yeah, I'm not talking about depositors. I'm really talking about- Yeah, equity yeah, shareholder equity. Yeah, 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 I agree. I mean, I mean, guys, even for like, I mean, participants, right, on the equity market, still there is a question of how attentive they are in terms of, I mean, I mean, that's related to the idea of market to market, right? So whether we need or whether we ever had uh, that, that intensity of attention. But I, I do think, yeah, going back to what Steve just mentioned, I mean, for SVB, I do think it's a sovereignty problem. I mean, maybe there, there are like liquidity problems for other regional banks. I'm not saying that, I mean, there is no liquidity problem for other regional banks in the uh, earlier regional banking crisis. But uh, um, I do think for SVB per se, it's pretty much like an um, obvious interest rate risk uh, mismanagement. 
to a different part of the Basel agenda, which is, uh, and I'm going to enter some jargon again here, is a fundamental review of the trading book. Uh, Steve, you've been a lot in those intricacies in your time in Basel. Can you explain to us what the FRTB is, how it fits into the bigger package, and uh, what are the issues specifically for the U.S.? Well, in detail, I cannot, so I won't try. You probably can do it better than I can. Um, but, I'm not uh, sure about that. But 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 I can I can give you the 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 one or two sentence summary, which is that trading book assets basically did not attract capital charges at all. There was an attempt to uh, before Basel III. In fact, the fundamental review of the trading book began before Basel III reforms began, and uh, and the idea again was to ensure that um, that when banks were engaged in trading activities, that they had capital funding for those trading activities uh, rather than simply using uh, using subsidized fixed liabilities uh, for those trading activities. And, um, and I think that that's something that most people would agree with if you're going to do that, that that's a risky activity and, and you are at risk of losses. And so that there should be there should be uh, capital buffers um, and banks should be forced to fund some of that with uh, with capital. And so that's what the trading book that that that's a sort of very high level summary of what the trading book is about. I I'm very very hesitant seeing the list of, of participants that we have a very esteemed list as you always have of getting into this very deeply because I'm sure some of them would be able to tell us in much more detail and uh, and with much more authority than I can. Yeah, on the FRTB. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. so... You're just nodding. Okay, so um, <laughs> let me move on to cross-border stuff. So, so we have the European Union has, I think, uh, made a final agreement on their adoption of the Basel III endgame a couple of days ago. So they're, they're adopting in a way which is not uh, compliant, certainly not fully compliant, um, um, and uh, maybe not compliant at all. Uh, but uh, and and a bit late, but uh, but still, I mean, at this point, uh, there is a scenario in which there is more adoption in the EU than in the US. Conversely, if I'm correct, but Yao will correct me if not, uh, China has been on, certainly on paper uh, adopting the Basel package uh, in uh, in a pretty compliant way. Can both of you um, get us through these cross-border differences, discrepancies, frictions, whether that creates actual level playing field issues or whether, given the relatively domestic nature of many of those activities, at least considered within large jurisdictions, um, you know, the, the, the competitive distortions that are often invoked by uh, the banking industry uh, are actually a second order factor. Uh, Steve, how do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think that I, I actually have sort of think about this very simply, and that is that jurisdictions are going to do what's best for them, not what's best for you. So you should always take that into account and make sure that your uh, that your banks are resilient to what those other people might do to you. And so, um, and so, I think that uh, I think that the the, the cross border issues here that have to do with Questions about how it is that you do consolidation, uh, what sort of information sharing you're uh, you're going to be having, and the like. Um, I think these are very difficult. I do not believe that level playing field arguments should lead; they they lead to a race to the bottom. That's what level playing fields are about from the bank's perspective. They say, oh, those people over there are being more lax. You're being more rigorous than them. I can't compete in their jurisdiction. The answer cannot be, okay, you can be unsafe so that you can compete there. OK, and um, and and I think that that's that that was the original rationale, the original rationale behind the uh, the the Basel Accord, the, the original Basel Accord was to ensure that banks that, that, that banks around the world were all compliant with some minimum level of capital requirements, because at the time, banks in many jurisdictions basically had no capital whatsoever, um, funding whatsoever. And I think this was a big problem. This was a, a statement, you know, Walter Riston had had won in his argument against Paul Volcker, where Walter Riston, who was the longtime 
head of uh, of Citibank at the time said that banks don't need any uh, any capital funding uh, because they're so well run and so well diversified. Um, and uh, and that was something that the I, 80s, right? That was in the 80s. Yes, yes. That went very well. Uh, for them, it did not. Exactly. But um, but uh, but the solution to that, it seems to me, is to have high uniform capital requirements. And because somebody else is willing to have more lax capital requirements than you, as I said, does not seem to me to be a rationale for you having uh, having less safe banks. Um, I think that there is a problem in, in cross border banking that that we may may get to a point where there's more and more ring fencing, which is to say that there's more and more uh, desire on the part of the jurisdictions that don't trust each other to ensure that the that the banks or the subsidiaries that are in that are that have banking licenses in their jurisdictions um, have capital and liquidity uh, capital funding and 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 liquid assets that are uh, that are somehow inside of their jurisdiction and they're not flowing across borders. I think that's the risk, um, and uh, and and I think that we may we may come to that in any case. Well, that's what the U.S. has done with the requirement of having, uh, what do they call it, intermediate folding companies or something. That's correct. Right? That, 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 that's correct. And I think that many emerging market countries have uh, have done this as well because they basically don't trust the large countries. When, when, you, when, you look, when, we, when you look back, was it a mistake by the U.S. to impose these uh, intermediate holding requirements? I don't believe so because I think that the, the, the idea I, – I don't think that you can trust – I don't think that any jurisdiction can trust any other jurisdiction to either share confidential information, information, or what, or do what's in the collective good if doing something that's in their benefit is better. Yeah, but this you know the situation in China much better than the rest of us. Um, how is those level playing field viewed from China? I mean, in a way, you could imagine. I mean, I know that Chinese banks have a different way of lobbying than European right, or right, US right. banks, but yeah. uh, but I could imagine them complaining to the Chinese authorities that uh, you know uh, the US and Europeans are not doing Basel III as much as China did. That's that's uh, fully true, and uh, as you probably know, I mean the very largest banks are all state armed in China, and uh, I mean it's pretty much like a government effort rather than uh, what happened here in the US or in Europe. And also another important thing is in China there is a big sector called big tech sector uh, in which a lot of companies, especially platform companies like Tencent and Alibaba, they actually they increasingly providing uh, banking services to the general public. And uh, if you go to China, actually, when you make payments, I mean, very rarely you're going to use credit cards or debit card, uh, but you basically uh, and, and you, you, you get a QR code and they scan your form and uh, all the cash is moving around through those platforms. And I guess that's another important thing, which um, I mean, in China, also in some other developing countries, like in India, in Brazil, um, I don't think, I mean, the currently framework of banking regulation has much to do um, in regard to those like increasingly popular uh, uh, non-bank sector or fintech sector. I, I do want to maybe, maybe very quickly add something to the cross-border issue, because another thing which I think is important is the increasing role of US dollars being the dominant currency, because that's related to uh, the provision of cross-border banking services, given that, I mean, um, I mean, foreign banks and foreign corporates are increasingly use US dollars to settle um, financial, um, financial transactions, financial contracts. Also, people are increasingly use US dollars to pay US um, dollar invoice trades. And, and I think that's maybe something important for us to keep in mind going forward, because that's definitely related to how banks in different jurisdictions um, providing like dollar denominated services to uh, their clients. So. Can I just point out that I think that a number of jurisdictions are very clear that if a that if a uh, institution is issuing dollar denominated um, liabilities, that they have to meet things like liquidity requirements and the like in by currency so it's um it, it, this is a, another one of those problems that occurred in, in this a leftover from the sort of 2007 2009 crisis was that we we realized that that you you can't meet liquidity requirements overall you need to meet them by currency if you're yes. issuing liabilities in other currencies the other thing is and we don't think we don't have time to talk about this but i think that the federal reserve has finally realized their responsibility in this 
with the creation of this foreign institution and monetary authority repo facility, which did not exist during the last crisis, um, because they're not going to offer swap lines to everybody, but they will offer that to everybody. Um, so that's a very good point. Uh, there's a question which is not exactly on our topic, but which is interesting from uh, Court Shack um, regarding uh, uninsured depositors. Uh, very quickly, Steve, uh, because I don't want this to be the last question, but uh, should regulators request that Congress reinstitute the transaction accounts guarantee uh, program um, uh, as it was done during the great financial crisis? Um. <laughs> This is a great this is a great debate, and I think it's a debate about about how to structure deposit insurance, um, uh, because that program guaranteed everything, including money market funds. Um, and uh, and and I think that it's it's probably my, my answer. My answer is no, um, but a qualified no, which I don't think we have time for. We have time for here. I will point to a chapter in a book that uh, that I that I, I I participated in called about SVB from the NYU Stern School that does discuss deposit insurance at some length. Yeah, and uh, it's a very good book indeed. Um, so Bastian Yazbet. Uh, asks if there is any way to get out of the devilish cycle of, you know, uh, <laughs> regulator, regulatory tightening after crisis and loosening. I mean, in a way, it was your chart with the, with the uh, capital levels going back to their uh, 2010 level or so. Um, I mean, do we really need to have another crisis to uh, remember that capital requirements are important? Uh, what the, what What's how can this karma be escaped? Um, well, of course, we all hope not. But then again, we all hope that uh, we hope we hope that Europe uh, and the European Union can progress without crises, also. But it never seems to happen. Um, and uh, and and so I, I think that um, th there's a there's a big problem that that authorities always face where they want to force people to. Uh, incur costs or to incur what they believe to be costs to keep things from happening. And then they say, oh, isn't this great? There was no crisis. And everybody says, oh, but I paid this cost and now there's no crisis. At least it's unfortunately not like auto insurance where we drive by, uh, we, where we drive by and see auto accidents or fire insurance where we see houses burning down. Um, uh, we don't want to see this. And so uh, I'm afraid that we may be trapped in that. Uh, um, I guess I'd be interested in Boschan's answer later, but he can tell me when we talk again uh -oh. well, I'm, so how do you, look, you look at it uh, also i'm i'm curious about the chinese perspective because the chinese system as you said is very state-owned uh and um and and in a way there uh there are no systemic financial crises as we know them in a privately owned uh financial system so 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 how how do you look at this debate about the long cycles of regulation uh, in a country like the U.S.? Yeah, I guess, I mean, one thing uh, I think people have been debating about is whether there is a need for state contingent capital requirements. So, you know, it's ex ante, we may come up with some rules to kind of index capital requirements to some um, aggregate economic conditions, such as interest rate, or inflation, or maybe uh, some financial market volatility-based index. I do think, I mean, that's very hard to implement, but uh, uh, in some sense, if we look at, I mean, countries like China, in which the bank sector is much more centralized and it has much more influence from the regulatory side, and you could think of that as something closer to this idea of state contingent capital requirements, because there is not so clear distinction between a, a supervisory view of implementing capital requirements or something which is hardwired into the rules. But again, so um, I mean, I'm with Steve that uh, in terms of the cost of implementing those state contingent or time varying and capital requirements could be also large and uh, in countries like US or in uh, European countries. So, and it's unclear to me and to what extent we can actually implement such rules. Maybe a pedestrian question to conclude, Steve. Um, do you think the proposals of the agencies on Basel 3 and Game will be adopted? Uh, what's your outlook? <laughs> 
Um, I'm very concerned <laughs> uh, that they will, that they, I think that some form of them will be adopted, although it will not be what we've seen so far. Um, and I, I cannot predict exactly what will happen. Um, there's some, there's some details in the negotiation that we don't need to get involved in here, where it looks like there is room for, uh, it looks like there's room for some negotiation that will lead to adoption. The one thing that I am very concerned about, however, is this uh, business with this thing called the Administrative Procedures Act, which is a, a very, a very complex U.S. Uh, law. And the fact that the in, that the cost benefit analysis on the implementation is not completed yet, and will have to be completed in a convincing way before it can be adopted, or if it's not, uh, then the uh, the banks will the banking industry will then be able to go to court and use this Administrative Procedures Act to stop the implementation. So I'm concerned about those parts of the, the, those more than I am about the implementation, about the agreement itself. Thank you. Um, this concludes our session and also our cycle for the year 23. We'll have uh, more of those discussions in 24. Indeed, in late uh, January, we'll certainly have a session about the Basel agenda, but at a global level from the Basel committee's perspective. Uh, meanwhile, uh, let me, um, uh, wish happy holidays to our audience and uh, give warm thanks to our two speakers, uh, Steve Cecchetti and uh, Yao Zhang, for uh, the illuminating uh, conversation. Thanks very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, happy holidays. And again, thank you for putting putting together such an interesting series. Thank you. Yeah, it's so interesting and illuminating.